is Christ our Lord. Thank you, choir, for that musical reminder this morning. Take your Bibles, if you will, now. Turn with me to the Gospel of Luke, chapter 2. The Gospel of Luke, chapter 2. Before I speak this morning, let's pause for just a moment and ask God by His Spirit to touch our lives and give us ears that will hear. The Spirit says to the church this morning. Father, we're thankful for the reason for the season. We're thankful today that in our life, we have reason to celebrate. We have reason to sing praises unto our God. The God has been faithful to his word. Now we have a reason to live. A reason to live not only during this season, but a reason to live every day. Knowing that every day, our Lord walks with us and talks with us, tells us that we belong to Him, gives us care and love. We're thankful for that. I pray, Lord, that in these next moments that we spend together, may the Spirit of the living God so fall upon each of us that we will know that we have been in the very presence of a risen cross. And I pray that we may listen together today to what the Holy Spirit says to the church. May we be strengthened. And I pray that should there be those here this morning who do not know the real reason for the season, who have never really come into a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, I pray today that by your Holy Spirit you will speak. I pray that you will bring conviction. And I pray that when we leave the house of God today, that every one of us may leave with the joy of Christmas ringing in our hearts. May we leave today knowing that whatever the future may hold, that we have Christ as our Lord and Savior. To this end, Lord, may the anointing be upon those who are here today and upon your word. For it is in the lovely name of Jesus, my Savior, that I pray. Amen. On that first Christmas when Christ was born in Bethlehem, the Bible tells us here in the second chapter of Luke that in the countryside there were shepherds keeping watch over their flock by night. Beginning about verse 9, the Bible tells us that the angel of the Lord came upon them. And the glory of the Lord shone round about them and they were so afraid. The angel said unto them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. This shall be a sign unto you. You shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the, multi the angel a multitude of the heavenly host, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest and on earth. Peace, goodwill toward men. Peace, such a sweet sounding word. All of us would love to live in a world that is dominated by peace. Peace not only among nations, but also a peace within our own life. What a great world it would be to live in. If we had peace among the nations of the world, and if we could somehow achieve peace even in our own life, is it possible? Is it possible to experience peace in our world today? The history of mankind is a history of war and conflict from without and turmoil from within. The history of mankind seems to be that man will never be able to achieve peace because man cannot get along with his neighbor and neither can man achieve any kind of peace in his own heart and life. There seems to be always a conflict, a turmoil that goes on within our life. Turn with me, if you will, to Matthew's Gospel, chapter 24. <coughs> It would seem as we look at into our world today that we are further from world peace today than at any other point in history. 
on almost every page on your daily newspaper. You will find stories of conflict among nations, among peoples of our world. It makes us wonder, will there ever be peace even in individual nations? Notice what Jesus has to say in verse 6 and 7. And ye shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that ye be not troubled. For all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nations shall rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. And there shall be famines and pestilence and earthquakes in diverse places. And these are all just the very beginnings of sorrow. Seems almost like a commentary on our world today. War among nations, not necessarily a, a global war, but as you look at it into a world, you have to know and to understand that we're living in a time when there is global war. Factions within nations warring against other factions. People against people. Nation against nation. Certainly Christ knew what he was talking about. When he spoke about the time of the end being a time filled with, with war and conflict and a lack of peace. And yet as I know all of that, I cannot he help but go back and remember that message the angel gave. That message the angels gave when Christ was born in Bethlehem. The message the angels gave to those shepherds. The angels on the night of Christ's birth said, Glory to God in the highest and on earth, on earth, peace, goodwill toward <coughs> man. I cannot help but remember what the prophet Isaiah said back in the ninth chapter of Isaiah. Turn back to Isaiah chapter 9. Isaiah chapter 9 and verse 6. Speaking in prophecy of the coming Messiah. <coughs> the babe that is born in Bethlehem, verse 6. For unto us a child is born. Unto us a son is given. The government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful, the Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father. Notice, the Prince of Peace. That's what Isaiah had to say. A child is born. A child that will become the Prince of Peace. I also remember what Jesus had to say during his time on the earth. Turn to the Gospel of John, chapter 14. The Gospel of John, chapter 14, verse 27. Notice what Jesus says. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give unto you. Not as the world giveth, give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. 16th chapter of John, verse 33. These things have I spoken unto you, that in me you might have peace. In the world you shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. These are the words of Jesus. Jesus said, I have come that you might have peace. In me you might have peace. I cannot help but remember what Paul had to say later in writing to the church. Turn to 2 Thessalonians chapter 3. 2 Thessalonians chapter 3. And verse 16. Paul said to the church of Thessalonica, Now the Lord of peace himself give you peace always by all means. The Lord be with you. And then writing to the church at Colossae, turn to the book of Colossians chapter 3. Colossians chapter 3 and verse 15. Paul says, And let or allow the peace of God rule in your hearts to the which also you are called in one body and be ye thankful. In the Old Testament, we have a prophecy. A son is going to be, a child is going to be born, a child that will become the Prince of Peace. The angels, when the child was born, said, Glory to God in the highest, and on this earth, peace, goodwill toward men. 
Jesus himself also said, I want you to have peace. I am going to leave with you peace. Paul later, writing to the churches, talked about peace that we could experience. With the Bible saying so much about peace, and the fact that peace is available to us today, it makes me ask the question, why is it that we do not experience peace in our own life? Why is it when the Bible and when Jesus says, I want you to have peace, why is it that even so many Christian people <clears throat> cannot find peace in their heart and in their life? Life's always in a turmoil and always seem to be boiling from within. When the Bible says so much about peace, why is it that we cannot experience peace in our world today? You remember the time when Jesus, about a week before his crucifixion, Jesus rode into Jerusalem on a donkey. We call it Palm Sunday. And as Christ rode into Jerusalem, there were shouts of praise and hosanna. The hills fairly rang with joy and praise. Hosanna to the Son of God, to Jesus Christ, the Prince who is coming. But during that time of celebration, Jesus has something very interesting to say. Why don't you turn with me to Luke's Gospel, chapter 19. Luke's Gospel, chapter 19. Why don't you notice something that Jesus said. Verse 41. As they were going into the city with all the shouts and the praise, notice what Jesus said. Verse 41. And when he was come near, he beheld the city and wept over it, saying, If thou hadst known, even thou, at least in this thy day, the things which belong unto thy peace, but now are they hid from thine eyes. What was he saying? In the midst of celebration, Jesus looked down at the city and tears poured from his face. Not tears of joy. But he says to the multitude and to Jerusalem, to the people of the day, if you had only known, if you could just understand what would bring you peace today, but you don't understand that, it is hid from your eyes. And I would almost say that today as we look into a world that is so filled with, with fear and a lack of peace, it would almost seem that today there is a barrier. A barrier that has been erected and we cannot see, we cannot understand why we do not have peace. Today I want us to take down that barrier and look into the Word of God mm -hmm. and see what the Bible has to say about peace. How you and I can achieve peace in a world that is so filled with fear and turmoil and war and conflict. Jesus said we can have it. If Jesus says we can have it, I want it. I want to show you this morning what the Bible has to say about that. First of all, I want to give you a clue. first clue is found in John chapter 16. Turn to John chapter 16. And we have the first clue that will take you on the road to discovering peace in your own life. John chapter 16, verse 33. Jesus said these things, all the things he's been talking about, warning them the things that's going to be happening in the world. Jesus said, these things have I spoken unto you, that in me you might have peace. In the world you shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. Jesus says two things to us here. Two things. The first thing Jesus says to us, in this world you're going to have tribulation. Never forget that. Jesus makes it very clear that in this world, the word tribulation there means pressure, affliction, <coughs> disaster, distress, all of these things you're going to experience. Christ says to his disciples, listen, I want you to know this. In this world, you're going to have all the pressure you can take. You're going to be faced with all of these things in the world. That's the first thing Christ wants us to understand in our life. And the closer we get to the second coming of Christ, the more pressure we're going to experience. 
the more violence, the more greed, the more hatred. All of these things are going to increase. The Bible tells us so. So Christ makes it very clear here. I want you to know this, that in this present world, you are going to have all the problems and the difficulties and the pressure that you can experience. In other words, there is not going to be a world peace until Jesus comes again. Do not look for a time when there will be a world peace treaty and all nations will be at peace one with us. It's not going to happen. As a matter of fact, the closer you get to the coming of Christ, you're going to see more and more in your paper of conflict within nations. Nations being torn by strife. Nations being torn from within, even as much as we see in Russia today. Even as much as we see among the Arab nations. Even as we see in many segments of our world. We're going to see that increase. There's going to be more war, more turmoil, more strife, and even more violence and hatred in our world. Christ makes that very clear. In this world, you're going to face that. Do not expect world peace until the Prince of Peace comes. But that will show you the second thing he says in this verse. These things have I spoken unto you that in me you might have peace. Notice. In the world, in the world, you're going to have pressure. In the world, on the earth, you're going to experience all of these things. But then he says, in me, in me, you might have peace. Wow. While we're facing a world that is filled with greed and hatred and violence and war and conflict and all the things that takes place in our own life, Jesus says, in the midst of all of this, you can experience peace in me. What did he mean? What does he mean that in him we will have peace? Well, let's turn to the 14th chapter of John and we'll see what he's talking about. John chapter 14 verse 27 peace I leave with you then he makes it clear my peace I give unto you now what you understand he says not as the world giveth give I unto you let not your heart be troubled <coughs> neither let it be afraid Christ is saying the peace that I'm going to give to you is a peace that the world will never understand it's not like anything you can ever experience outside of me. It is only for those who make a commitment to Christ, who make a commitment to Him, and allow Him to actually come into their life and live with them. I'm going to give my peace to you. You will not be able to escape the real world in which you live. It's going to be here. It's going to get worse. However, it is possible... It is possible to experience a real peace within, notice, because of the one who lives within. And there's the difference. It is possible to experience a peace within because of the one who lives within. Now, it's easy for us to identify with pressure and problems in the world because we live there. We know Jesus, you know what you're talking about. In the world, we see it all around us. We experience all of that. But how can we experience, how can we relate to that peace within? Christ said that in me, you might have peace. You can't explain it, but you can experience it. When Christ comes to live in your heart by the Holy Spirit, He can and will bring peace amid the storms of life. And I can't explain that to you this morning. I cannot explain that to you, but I can tell you from personal experience, you can experience it. You can experience a peace of God within just as surely as you experience war and conflict and violence and hatred in the world. It's just as real. It's just as real. And we can experience that in our own life. And many say, well, I don't understand that. I don't understand how I can listen. Let me ask you if you can understand this. There was a time when Christ was on the water with his disciples. He was tired. 
The Bible says he had gone to sleep because he was exhausted from the day. While Christ was sleeping, a great storm came on the water. And the water began to pitch and the boat began to toss and to turn and the water began to sweep into the boat and the boat was almost ready to go under. The disciples are filled with fear. Here's a, listen, many of these disciples were experienced fishermen. It was not just a little storm. It was a storm that threatened to literally destroy the boat and their line. And they awaken the mess and say, Lord, don't you care that we perish? And Jesus stands up in that little boat and just simply says, peace, be still. And immediately, the water calmed down just like glass. Can you understand that? I don't understand that. I don't understand how Jesus, in just a very calm voice, could say to a raging body of water, just be still. <coughs> I cannot explain to you how that Christ can come into a heart that is filled with turmoil and strife and conflict and all the pressures of life. I cannot explain how Christ can come into that life and say, Be still. But he does. He does. That's his promise. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give unto you. Not as the world giveth, give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled. Don't let it be afraid. Wow. In the world, you're going to have all of these things. But in Christ, in Christ, he said, you can have peace. Don't try to, don't try to figure it out. Experience it. That's what it's all about. Experience the calm that can come in here. You say, well, I've never experienced that. I don't know what you're talking about. Well, it's for you. It's for you. In the world, you'll have tribulation. You know what that's all about? Then just go on and believe that in Christ, you'll have peace. The psalmist had discovered that. Turn back to the book of Psalm chapter 4. The book of Psalm chapter 4. The psalmist experienced that calmness within his own life. Verse 8. Chapter 4, verse 8. The psalmist says, I will both lay me down in peace and sleep. For thou, Lord, only makest me dwell in safety. The psalmist could say, I'm going to bed tonight and I'm going to sleep, but I'm going to sleep in peace. There's going to be a calmness and a quietness in my life because I've discovered the way of peace. Thou, O oh Lord, are with me. I've discovered that in my own life. Chapter 29. Look at Psalm chapter 29. Verse 11. 29 verse 11. The Lord will give strength unto his people. The Lord will bless his people with peace. That's a statement. The Lord will bless his people with peace. The psalmist could say that because he had experienced it. He knew what it was all about. Listen, the psalmist knew what it was to experience problems. The psalmist knew what it was to, to be in fear of his own life. And yet he can say, listen, I can lay down and sleep under the stars at night with peace in my heart. God will give his people peace. That's what he's promised. And that he will do. Let me give you another clue to peace. Found in Psalm 119. <coughs> Psalm 119. First clue to peace is this. You've got to be in Christ. If you're not in Christ, you'll never experience peace within. Not going to experience that. But if you know Christ, and Christ lives in your heart, the Bible says He will give you peace. Clue number two. Psalm 119, verse 165. 165. This is a tough one. Great peace. Not just peace, but great peace have they which love thy law. 
and nothing, nothing shall offend them. Mm -hmm. That word offend means become a stumbling block. Wow. Great peace have they which love thy law, and nothing shall be a stumbling block unto them. Let me ask you this morning. Do you really love the law of God? Do you really love it? I mean, can you say, I really love the law of God? I really love to live the way God wants me to live. Many people say, well, let's see now. Uh, let's see if there's a loophole here. Can I get around this? How little can I do and still be a Christian? How many times you heard people say, well, you know, if I can just get into the kingdom of God by the skin of my teeth. Teeth don't have any skin. You're not going to make it. If you're planning to get in by the skin of your teeth, you're not going to make it. But the Bible says here, great peace. Tremendous peace, overwhelming peace, God will give to those who love His law. Do you love the Word of God? Do you love the things of God? Or is the Bible just a decoration in the house? You put it in the house, you, you close your home today, and you put the Bible in and say, Well, see you next week. And you love the newspaper, you love the sports magazines, and the fishing magazines, and hunting magazines. Can't wait the next one gets here, and, and Vogue, and all, all kinds of junk. But you don't love the Word of God? If you don't love the Word of God, you're not going to get peace. Maybe you walk around some toes, but I'm just telling you how it is. You wonder why I don't have peace in my heart? The Bible says, great peace, great peace. God gives to those who love His Word. If you don't love the Word of God, what the psalmist say earlier, I believe it's about the first psalm, says He meditates in His Word day and night. And yet many people who call themselves Christians never read their Bible, never pick it up, and yet they say, Oh God, won't you do all these things? God said, Listen, if you want something from me, get in the Word and see how to get it. Great peace. God will give to those who love His Word. It may be today that you're living in fear and torment and a lack of peace within because you don't love the Word of God. You endure it. You just have to read it once in a while because you're a Christian. But the clue is, they who love the Word of God. You know, why do we love the Word of God? It's a letter from the one we love. It's a letter from God Himself who says, I love you and I'm going to give you a letter. And those who love God love God's love letter. And they read about it. And in the Word, God tells us how to have peace and how to achieve all these things in life. And that's why the Word says, Great peace have they that love the Word of God. And when you have a, a love for the Word of God, you can understand what's happening in our world. You don't have to stumble about things that happen. Things happen in the Word. Say, yeah, I understand that because the Bible tells me about it. Death comes. <coughs> I understand the Bible tells me about it. Problems come. You yeah, understand that the Bible tells me about it. Difficulties come. Yeah, the Bible tells me about that. Everything that happens in life doesn't become a stumbling block because you know the <coughs> Word of God. <coughs> Great peace. You want peace with that? You've got to love the Word of God. Do you love the Word of God? Now let's look for some advice. Proverbs chapter 3. Turn to Proverbs chapter 3. Good advice for all of us. Proverbs chapter 3, verse 1. My son, forget not my law. Notice. But let thine heart keep my commandments. See, it's not enough just to get into the mind. It's got to get down here in the affections. For you love the word of God. My son, forget not my law, but let thine heart keep my commandments. Now listen, when we do that, for length of days and long life and peace shall they add to thee. Simple. Simple. Love the Word of God. Know what God's Word has to say. Keep the Word from our heart. And when we do all of that, the Bible says, well, we just live longer and we'll have peace. Do you know that you can actually cut your life short by worry and fretting and all of that? Sure can. 
advice the Word of God says just get to know the Word of God. Get to fall in love with God. Fall in love with the Word of God. Begin to see what God has to say. And you'll be able to live in a world that is filled with fear and frustration and problems. And yet have peace in that world. That's what the Word says. Forget them not. For in so doing, you'll experience. Romans chapter 15. Turn to Romans chapter 15. And verse... 13. Romans 15, 13. Great verse. Now the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing that ye may abound in hope through the power of the Holy Ghost. Now listen, what he's saying here, the Holy Ghost that comes and lives in your life, that Holy Ghost will give you joy and and it will give you peace through believing. That's how it comes. Through believing, through trusting. Through believing who God is and what God is. And through believing that He will bring peace. When you have the Holy Ghost living within, that Holy Ghost will bring joy to your life and will bring peace to your life through believing. That's the clue. That's the clue. Isaiah chapter 26. Beautiful verse. I'm going to just read it this morning. I have something to say more about it later in another message. But Isaiah chapter 26, verse 3. If you don't know it, you ought to memorize it. Make a verse to memorize for the next year. Thou wilt keep him in perfect peace. Thou wilt keep him in perfect peace. With the rest of it whose mind is stayed on thee because he trusted in thee. Wow. God will keep us in perfect peace if we keep our mind on him. Keep our mind on him because those who keep their mind on him trust in him. And trust in him brings peace within. 2 Thessalonians chapter 3. 2 Thessalonians chapter 3. Verse 16. I read this earlier, but I want you to notice. Now the Lord of peace himself, I want you to notice this, give you peace always by all means. Can't get any clearer than that. The Lord of peace himself give you peace sometime, no, always, in all things, in your problems, in your difficulties. When things go wrong, always give you peace. That's what God promised. In me, you will have peace. In the world, you have all these other things. They're going to come. You're not immune to them. But right in the middle of that raging storm, in Christ, you can have peace. Wow. You know, the angels knew what they were talking about when they came on that birth of Christ and sang, Glory to God in the highest and on earth. On earth. Peace. Good will. To them. Now whether we experience that peace or not, it's up to us. He gave the promise that you can have peace. Whether you experience that peace or not, it's up to you. All the clues are given in the word of God. All you got to do is follow the clues. Follow not the star of Bethlehem, but follow the Son of God. And in this world, you can have peace. In Father, I'm grateful that even though we live in a world that is filled with turmoil and war and conflict and strife and hatred and greed and, and a multitude of other things, we know we live in that. We experienced that. You told us we would. But Lord, you told us that in the midst of all of this, that in you, we can experience peace. Lord, there may be those here this morning who are struggling. Maybe those here this morning who need to make new commitments to Christ. I pray if this be the case, Lord, that you will speak just now. 
And may we make those decisions and those commitments that will bring the peace of God into our life. In Jesus' name, amen.